don't want to keep you long here today. We just want to go over some some word uh, this morning, um, and we want you to understand the words that we're teaching. So we're just going to um, uh, start maybe in Genesis and go to Revelation. Is everybody okay with that? Amen. Sure. <laughs> But not one before the other. You want to be effective in the Lord first, and then you'll be effective in the things that you do in the world. Amen. And so last week we learned through our, our studying of the word, we learned uh, that uh, through establishing a true relationship with Jesus, the sting of temptation that the temptation has had over our lives is no more. It's no longer as powerful as it used to be when you're in the world. When you're in the world, you know that, I mean, you, you don't know that what you're doing is wrong. When you're in the spirit, when you understand who God is, that sting of doing things wrong doesn't, it's not longer there. That temptation doesn't uh, excite you like it excited you before. It didn't excite you before to want to go out to a club or go out to a place or go have some drinks and go get drunk. Anybody remember that? Yeah. I'm, I'm only telling, uh, you know, the truth behind everything that we have done in our lives. You remember how you used to plan for uh, for a, what is it, happy uh, happy Fridays or, uh, you know, you plan, plan to go out and say, I, I can't wait to go out and get drunk. Amen? And uh, you know you used to have those days, I can't wait till Friday. Woo! Go out and do these things. And so that thing is gone when you become in the Lord. And so we understand that those temptations that the world has for us is no longer as powerful as our relationship with God. Now we change. We shifted from saying we are excited about going to uh, to to you know uh, crazy Fridays and and to, to get drunk and do all those things to getting drunk in the Lord. I can't wait to praise God. That we said that now. We talk now. I can't wait to get in my prayer closet. I can't wait to worship God. I can't wait to hear every. Of the spirit, that the sting that all that other stuff had on you is no longer. It's gone. And so you lose that, that, that sting that used to be, you know, we call it a change, but it's a change of spirit. You have changed from believing in the world to believing in God. And so there's no more power over the temptation that the enemy has for us anymore. There's no more power over that. Um, you know, as you grow in the Lord. And so we no longer fear the outcomes because our faith is in Jesus. We're no longer stressing over all the things that are going to happen and trusting in God. See, as baby Christians, we fear. Yeah. But as we grow in the Lord, we start to, the fear becomes less and our praise becomes more. Can I get an amen this amen. morning? And so... Nothing should be able to steal our joy. Not, 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 not good things or bad things or what we consider good or bad. None of those things can steal our joy because we know that the Lord has control over our lives. We know that no matter what circumstance has over, uh, comes upon us, no matter what sickness or what uh, trial we have in our lives, we have glory in God. We, the, 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 the faith that we have in Jesus Christ is more powerful than the fear that we have in the enemy. And so we realize that we have victory over sin through Jesus Christ. We're not worried about sin. We're not even in the column of sin anymore. We don't even think about those things no more. That means that, that doesn't mean that we're not going to sin, but we know we already have the victory through Jesus Christ. So instead of uh, condemning ourselves with the sin, we're praising God for what he has done in our lives. Amen? Amen. So now we have victory. And when we realize that, when we realize that uh, it's already done, that that sin we may have committed, that thing we may have done wrong, it was already done when Jesus died on the cross. We realize that Satan's power was demolished on the cross. His power, sometimes we give him more power than he has, not realizing that the, 
the, the, the, the war had already been won through Jesus Christ. And so it's important to understand that, that uh, we have victory through Jesus Christ. And so we, can, we, we don't consume ourselves thinking about the sinful things we can do. When you come to Christ, you're not thinking about all the things you can do wrong or all the places you can go or all the things you can say wrong or those little things that you hide from other people. You think about what you can do in Christ Jesus. Instead of uh, consuming ourselves on, on what the enemy has, we consume ourselves on what the Father has done through the Son, Jesus Christ. And now, do you get tired of praising God? Do you get tired of lifting up the name of Jesus? Do you get tired of saying Jesus over every circumstance? Getting up in the morning and thanking him that you are able to breathe. Thanking him that you're able to walk. You're able to, do you ever get tired of that? No. And so, uh, instead, we uh, consume, our, consume ourselves with what the Father has done through the Son. Jesus has, I want you to write down this, Jesus has justified you who believe that he is worthy. Jesus has justified you who believe that he is, wor that he is worthy. And so, what I mean by justification, that means he made you right with God. You can't make yourself right with God. He has already made you right with God. And so there's nothing you can do for the rest of your life to make you better or right with God. You just walk in order with God as you walk in your salvation walk. Jesus has already completed the process of making you right with God. And that means you're worthy to heaven. Mm. It's, a and so it's a transition from a life in the world to eternal life through the Holy Spirit. Uh, you go from realizing that what you thought was okay and normal is not okay and normal. I thought it was okay and normal to not be able to remember people's name when, by the end of the night. Anybody ever thought that? I thought well, he said, no, I never thought that. I, I thought it was okay for people to uh, wake up puking on themselves and doing all that crazy stuff. I thought that was okay. I thought it was normal stuff. Oh, they just got over and leave drunk. But that's not okay. And when you're in the Holy Spirit, when you understand the work of the Holy Spirit, you understand life. You're not sitting there asking yourself, why was I created here? You understand why you were created here. For the Father. And so we are, uh, we, we, you know, what we learn to do is transition from one life to the eternal life, which is through the Spirit. And so what we're doing now is we're practicing in our present for our future with the Lord. Where we're practicing, we're working in our spirit, we're learning to trust God, we're learning to give all honor and glory to God, we're working, we're practicing in our present for our future with the Lord. Now the Apostle Paul was explaining um, to the Roman church, he was explaining to them uh, and expounding on the weight of temptation and sin. Remember he was saying in chapter 7, I do not understand what I do because I do not do what I want to do and I know that the law is good and all. But I still do wrong. So he went in that direction, expounding on the way of temptation and sin. Uh, now he uh, went from that in chapter 8 to expounding on the important uh, role of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is received, for those who don't know, is received as a gift from God. It's not something you have to work for. It's something that's given to you the moment you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. So it's important to understand what the Holy Spirit is and what the Holy Spirit does for us um, on a day-to-day -day basis. It's not, it's, it's, it's not good enough just to say, oh, I got the Holy Spirit. It's, good, it's great to understand who the Holy Spirit is, what the Holy Spirit does for you, what you obtain and obtain in the Holy Spirit, and the, the blessing that you have upon your life. And so, um, now Paul expounds on this. He expounds on what the Spirit does and what the Spirit does for us. And so if you're ready, say, I'm ready. I'm ready. So Paul continue, uh, Paul's continuation begins at uh, chapter 8, verse 1. And I say continuation because anytime you're reading the Scripture, uh, when you go into another chapter and the first thing it says is, therefore, <laughs> yeah, you got it. If it says, therefore, it's referring to something of the past, something that was said previous to that chapter. And that's why you know, we got to understand that as Christians, because the original scripture was not written with chapters. 
It didn't have chapters. It was written according to, to, to what God put upon their hearts, but it wasn't written in chapters like uh, they put chapters in the book later. And so let's read chapter 8, verse 1. You ready? Say, I'm ready. I'm ready. Amen. It says, therefore, there is now. Everybody say now. Now. No condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set us free from the law of sin and death. Mm -hmm. So now, I mean, once you accept the Lord, there is no condemnation. Con to, to condemn means, what does it mean? It means you, you are not, uh, you, you are, there is condemnation on you. You, you, uh, you can't look at things from, from a spiritual standpoint. There, you know, and so to be no condemnation, it means that there is no condemning you. You are made right with God. And so we understand that Conde says, therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit uh, who gives life has set you free. Look at your neighbor and say, I am free. I am free. And so once you have accepted the Lord, you are no longer responsible for the crimes you have committed in your life against God. Whether you knew them or not, whether you understood them or not, you are no longer responsible to those crimes because Jesus has set you free from those crimes. He has paid the penalty for every crime that you have done wrong against the Lord, even the ones you didn't know you've done wrong. It says, but now, it says, now through Christ Jesus you are set free. Not only are you justified, meaning made right. Everybody say made right. Made right. You are made right, justified. But you're also, you were justified in the future, meaning you have eternal life. But the one thing that we don't know is that you're also justified in the present. And that's the thing we sometimes forget. We say, man, I can't wait to get to heaven and have eternal life and do this and do this. No, no, no. You're also justified in the present, meaning you stand in God's grace, not under the Father's wrath. Do you understand that? How many people have done something wrong to me? God will get me for that. Stop. You're justified by faith in Jesus Christ. God is not going to give, get you for that. He's going to forgive you for that. As long as you give it to the Lord. Now, if you don't give it to the Lord, who steps in? The enemy. The enemy is not forgiven. The enemy uses his power that he doesn't have when you have faith in Jesus Christ. And so when you do something wrong, the best thing to do is to say, I'm sorry, my Lord. I forgive me. Forgive me. And he is faithful to forgive you of all your sins, everything you've done wrong, just by you saying that, just by you asking him, just by you feeling repentant and receiving the Lord and asking him to forgive you of what you have done. We condemn ourselves of things we have done wrong because we can't get over it, but God can. Because of the mighty work that Jesus Christ has done. And so, you're not responsible for the crimes you have committed against God. And you have been set free and justified, not just in the past, I mean in the future, but in the present. And so, to stand in God's grace, I want you to understand what that is. In verse uh, 3, it says, for what the law um, for what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own, only son um, in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that righteous, uh, the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. We can put that in simple words. Paul was saying that it is impossible to please God through the Mosaic law. It is impossible to please God through doing everything right. Even if you don't know the Mosaic law, you know it's right, it's, it's right not to kill, right? We understand that. You know it's right not to steal. You know it's right not to be jealous or envious or anything like that. And so even if you fulfill all those requirements and did all those things wrong in, Christ, in, in, in the law, with the law, the law doesn't make you right with God. 
There's nothing you can do to make yourself right with God without Jesus Christ. And so Paul was saying that it's impossible to please God through the Mosaic law. You cannot please him. And so the requirements of the law, what he's saying here, is there is no freedom, just condemnation. What does he say? He says, for what the law was powerless to do, meaning there's no freedom in the law. The law was powerless. It cannot make you right with God. It said God did by sending his only son. So there's no righteousness in doing things right. There's only righteousness in Jesus Christ. And so the requirements of the law, there's no freedom. I want you to write that down. Uh, fulfilling the laws, make, there's no freedom, just condemnation. And so if, if you can do ten, you can do nine things right, but that one thing you did wrong, somebody's going to talk about. How, how many people are Christians? How many people are believers in here? Say amen. Amen. And you've done all kinds of things right. You, you, you love people. You've shown love towards people. And then when you say one thing wrong, they say, that's not very Christian-like. Have you ever heard that before? <laughs> you see how the enemy works? The enemy works on that one thing, not the nine things you did right. And so stop trying to fulfill all the laws and fulfill love through Jesus Christ. Amen. And so it says here, um, what does it say here? It says here, and so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh but according to the spirit. What does, that, what does that make us understand? As a believer, I know you've done things wrong. I know you've said things wrong. I know I've done things wrong and said things wrong. But when I go before the Lord, the Lord doesn't see all those wrongs. He sees the one right, which is in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. So when you go before the Lord and you ask and repent of the things you've done wrong and went before the Lord, he doesn't see you as a bad person. You see yourselves as bad people sometimes, but he doesn't see you as a bad person. He sees you as righteousness. Do you understand that? Do you understand what we have obtained through the blood of Jesus Christ? He sees righteousness. He looks through all that murk. So you spend hours or minutes talking about something that he doesn't even see anymore. Because he only sees righteousness when you go before him. Why? Because his son did all the work. You've accepted his son. Therefore, when he sees you, he sees Jesus. Not, not, not maybe Jesus was something that, no, he sees his son. Because the spirit you have in him, I mean, you have in yourself, is the spirit that he gave to his son. So when he sees you, write this down, when God sees you, he is pleased. Say, but I lied, I did this. No, no, he is pleased. Let's everybody say that. He is pleased. But no, no, I, I did something wrong and I felt bad about it. And I no, no, he is pleased. But I've said some wrong things. I've been mad. I've had this anger in my heart. He's pleased with you because you have accepted his son. Verse 5 through 8 answers the question on what is obtained living without the spirit, living without Jesus. And so let's read verse 5. It says, those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live according to the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. Do you know? You, you sit there and say, man, I've made a big change in my life. No! God has made a big change in you. The only reason you're here today is not because of me. It's because of God. He has done a miraculous thing in you. Changed your heart from wanting to drink and smoke and do all those bad things to wanting to praise and worship and glorify His name on a day that He has made. When you realize the work that God has done in your lives, you realize that you are, you are moving in the spirit of God. So there's no question of whether you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. The enemy tries to put that question in your mind. But you still said that curse word last week. You still, that still slipped out of your mouth. Well, there's a difference between slipping out of my mouth and coming out of my mouth freely. 
See, when, when I was in the world, it didn't slip out of my mouth. Can I get an amen this morning? Amen. I purposely said it. I'm just telling the truth this morning. When, when it, if I told you something uh, with some hexes and O's and all that other stuff, I meant it. But now, if you slip and say something that sounds like a curse word, you say, oh, look, you just cursed. It's it never be good. <laughs> and then you say, oh, you just said it. No, I didn't say it on purpose and you feel bad about it. Why are you feeling bad about something God has forgiven you of? Yeah. I couldn't believe, I'm just mad. I can't believe I said that. Well, look, before you, when you were happy, you said that. Now, because you're mad, you said that means the spirit is working in you and, and is showing you things that you can tweak and fix, but the enemy tries to condemn you. So, it's, it's verse 6 says this, the mind governed by the flesh, the flesh is death. Wow. The mind governed by the flesh is death. But the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. Wow. What does it say? Uh, verse 8. Those, I mean, verse, uh, in verse 8. Those, oh no, verse 7. The mind governed by the flesh, the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God, nor can it do so. Do you understand that? The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God, nor can it do so. So stop questioning yourself on whether you are in Christ Jesus or whether you are in the world. You have given your life to Christ. The, I, the, the evidence of that is the change that happened. You think, I don't, uh, I, 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 I used to curse, but now I don't curse as much, but, but I still need to get my life right with God. No, God is working on you. That's why you don't curse so much. That's why you're stopping the things you used to do. That's why your life is changing. That's why your heart wants to go to church. That's why, check this out, when you don't go to church, you feel bad. Isn't that what happened? Before you'd be like, man, I'm glad I went. I went once in one month. <laughs> now, when you miss once in one month, what happened? What do you think about it? You feel bad. Like, man, I can't believe we tried to get there fast and we really wanted to be there today. I'm so sorry. I can't. Isn't that what we do? <laughs> Sit down those tables. I'm so sorry. I tried. I really tried. But before, it'd be like, man, I'm glad I came once. You see the shift that that guy Instead of telling you you're right for what you have done. So, it, it says, um, the mind of my flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. And it says, those who are in the law, or sorry, those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. Mm. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. So, without Jesus, a person will not listen to God and cannot please God. Mm. Look at your neighbor say, not for me. Not for me. The fact that you are here today is evidence that God is doing something in you. Can you give God a round of applause? Amen. Amen. Six 
Street. Tell the truth. Change the devil this morning. Sixth Street? Sixth Street? Seventh Street? Seventh Street? Look, you know all, you know all that Austin. Yeah, we could go out there. Yeah, we used to drive all the way across the, you know, the, the, the city to another city just to party. But we wouldn't go across the street to church. Now, it's like your church. Oh, this, 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 we can go over there. We can go to that church. Clear across town. Good, good. Drive past 20,000 other churches to go to your church in Jesus Christ. Do you understand the change that God does? And see, the look, you used to uh, enjoy. Hey, hey, fellas, can you give us some gas money? We can all go drive to Austin. Now you pay your own gas to drive across town to church. And you don't worry about it anymore because uh, the blessing of the Lord is in your life. You understand he's with you. He'll never leave you or forsake you. And he'll always take care of your business. Wow. So verse 9 says this. Verse 9 says this. Verse 9 says, you, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, they do not belong. of him. That's what it means. Those words mean this one is not of him. What do we know about Jesus? We know that our lives are pre, there's predestination when we talk about lives of the Christians who know Jesus. The, the Bible tells us over and over again about the predestination, the planning that God had for our lives. He doesn't talk about predestination when he's talking about the lives of the non-believers. He only talks about the lives of the believers because it has to take a miraculous work of God. God has to step out and do work for you in order for you to know him. He doesn't have to do that for, uh, for those who don't know him because it is the condition they live under the conditions of their sin. Well, for us, God did a miraculous work. He, he sent his son down. His son died for us. His son was buried for us. His son was resurrected for us that we might know who he is. Amen. If he wasn't resurrected, there'd be no purpose in us being here today. Because we have nothing to live for except dying. But because he was resurrected, it makes it a more miraculous thing. So, without Jesus, we won't listen to God. Without Jesus, it's impossible to know God. And to belong to Christ is to be of him. And so we have to understand that the Holy Spirit gives all believers the life in the Spirit. A person cannot have Christ and not have the Holy Spirit. A person cannot have the Holy Spirit and not have Christ. You have to have both because they're intertwined. And when you have Christ and the Holy Spirit, you also have the Father. And so it's mighty, to, it's, it's mighty to know who God is. It's mighty to know that that Holy Spirit lives in us. And the excitement that we have is because of the joy of the Spirit, the joy of the gift. The only reason, look, you, you can, the only reason you hear your song in the Spirit and enjoy your song in the Spirit is because of the Holy Spirit working on your life. That every time I can mention a song to you and you'll be like, man, that's my song. But we mentioned the songs of the world before we used to, do you remember back in the day? <laughs> back in the day, you used to hear that song coming, oh, that's a song. You did. Spilling your drink on the floor. Remember that? <laughs> I'm just telling my life. I'm not telling you. I'm telling mine. We had that drink. You know, you'd be sitting on the floor with a with little straw coming out. I'm just telling you. Coming out. I'm, Mom, I'm just so curious. I'm just, I'm just, you know, <laughs> this is how you would live. Spilling your drink everywhere. Just out on the floor and doing them two-step dances. Good, good. I want you to know I'm human just like you. And those things we used to do uh, before, you remember that? You used to hold your drink on the dance floor and dance and then try to get, they didn't even know the person's name. <laughs> Trying to get a phone number, remember that? Try to, you got your rolling next, you got your phone number, you got your phone list and all that stuff. All those things were of the flesh. But in the spirit, when your soul comes on, you're like, oh, Anybody done that? 
song used to come on, you used to think about that person. <laughs> Before your pains used to condemn you. 
Now they submit to the spirit that is within you. That's different. Before your pain used to keep you from getting up, you say, uh, look, this is what we do on Saturday. You say, I'm going to go to church tomorrow. And then you go out that night and say, man, I can't go to church tomorrow. I'm too tired. <laughs> now, this is what we do in the spirit. We say, uh, man, we want to go to Austin on Saturday. Okay, if we go to Austin on Saturday, as long as we're back by this time. How do you say that? Because I got to go to church in the morning. Yeah. That's how we do it. Do you see the shift that God does in your life? Say, we can do this on account that we get back by this time. And if we don't get back by, look, husband and wife, you fight a little bit. We go to church tomorrow. I just want you to know that. <laughs> then how we do it, brother? <laughs> <laughs> but we go to church in the morning. It was your idea to come out here and we're getting up one. Look, that's how we do it. We fight over that. Before we used to fight over everything else. Now we fight over that. No, we're getting up and going to church. Get your children up. Look, amen. And that's what we do, family. Amen. I know you're tired, but you should have been tired and not uh, and instead of saying it's going to interrupt with your church. If you if it's going to interrupt, you should know. Look, I'm just telling you about the fights we've had. You know, you go through all that. As you grow in Christ Jesus. Can mm -hmm. I get an amen this morning? Amen. amen. How we do it? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so, verse 10 and 11 tells us the, important of Jesus, the importance of Jesus being brought back to life. It says, but in Christ, uh, if Christ is in you, then even um, though your body is subject to death because of sin, the spirit gives life because of righteousness. And in the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Jesus from the dead will also give you your mortal bodies, uh, give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. What does that make you understand? It makes you understand that uh, Jesus died Jesus was buried and Jesus was resurrected by the Father in his new body. It makes you understand that your brother, Jesus Christ, your, your Lord, your Savior, Jesus Christ, showed you what's going to happen to you when you pass. You pass from the body to be present with the Lord. It gives you hope because hundreds of people saw him alive after he died. And so what does it tell you? Excitement. That I'm not worried about all the other religions and worried about all that other stuff. There is evidence that your Lord and Savior was back on this earth ministering with the holes in his hands. All the persecution he went through, he still came back to life and people saw him. Not just people who believed, but people all around saw Jesus come back from life, from death. What does that make you? It makes you excited. You get excited. There's no, uh, there's no fear anymore because you can trust that the Lord is with you. And so, in a nutshell, you have hope in eternal life when time meets up with the, uh, the day that the Lord has for you. You're not worried about death because you're a child of God. That is what we've been speaking of today. If you're a child of God and we just showed you evidence, then all you got to worry about is having faith in God. You got to trust your faith in God because the enemy no longer has his thing over your life. He can no longer take you out. He no longer has uh, the authority to kill you. Do you understand that, family? He doesn't have the authority. So if you are given an illness, it's because of God. If God does not want you to have it, he'll remove it from your life. Understanding that is huge. So we no longer fear. It's like, Lord, if it's your will, I ask that you remove this from me, but thy will be done. You're not always saying, God, why did you give me this? So, have you ever wondered why uh, when you finally give your life to the Lord, you feel new? You have more energy? You can do more with one hour of sleep than you could with a full 12? You're like, man, what's going on in me? I used to, uh, I used to have to get my sleep and, and get my body right, but now my body is made right through my faith in Jesus Christ. That's because you are new. You are a new creation. The old has passed away and you have become new. And as a new creation, you go from the shift. First, your flesh was on top and then everything else was under that. 
Now, as you shift into spirit, your spirit becomes on top. And your flesh submits to whatever your spirit does. That makes you powerful in the Lord. That makes you, you know, you defy the odds. There are miracles that happen. Normally, you need your eight to ten hours of sleep. But now, you have one hour of sleep, and you give it all to God. And you say, God, you, you help me. You take care of this. And for some reason, you wake up with energy, no matter how much sleep you had. And you give it all. says this. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not of the flesh, uh, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if you live, uh, uh, <laughs> if you live by the Spirit, you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Mm. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. Let your neighbor say, I am, I am a, child a child of God. Of God. Wow. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you will live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship, and by Him we cry, Abba, Father. Say, In Christ, living by the Spirit takes away the fear of loss and death or trials and tribulations. As you grow, as a child, when you're an infant in Christ, when you're an infant in Christ, fear may creep in. But as a child of God, you're more mature. You learn how to, to, to have faith in God instead of fear of the, the results. You become a mature Christian. Uh, you drop uh, all the fear and you take up faith. You are focused more on being part of God's family and less worried about the attacks of Satan. Your prayers become less about Satan and more about God's grace. Have you noticed that as you shift in Christ Jesus, your prayers become less about Satan? You're no longer even worried about Satan anymore. You have more faith in God. Before you used to be like, in the name of Jesus, Satan, I command you and your demons and all this other stuff. But now you're like, Father, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for waking me up this morning. Thank you for shielding me from the enemy. Thank you for, you know, look, your prayers become different as you grow. Lord, I thank you for my husband. I thank you for my wife. I thank you for my children. I thank you for this. I thank you for that. You become thankful instead of, oh man, I need to pray this and help me something else. You realize that through Christ Jesus, he has no power. You are focused more on being part of God's family and less on the enemy's attacks. And so the, the, the powerful thing about this is in the New Testament, because we just read where it said um, the spirit, I mean, it says um, the spirit you receive does not make you slaves uh, so that you live by fear again. Rather, the spirit you receive uh, brought about your adoption to sonship and in him, by him we cry, Abba, Father. In the New Testament, the adopted sons, when he uses adopted sons, uh, receive, those receive the same privileges as natural born sons. And so uh, we understand that we do not have to operate in fear. Because as adopted sons, when we think adoption in this world, uh, nine out of 10, your biological child gets more favor than your adopted child. That's how it is in some of the families in the world. But in the spiritual world, what we're talking about here, adopted sons have just the same favor that the regular son has. And so when you understand that, you understand that as a child of God, you can go to the Father just like the Son went to the Father. Can you say amen this morning? Amen. You can go to the, to the Father just like the Son. So when you look at what Jesus did, Jesus asked his Father for assistance, asked his Father for healing. Even though Jesus was God and could do it himself, he still sought after the Father. Why is that important? Because he wants you to see 
got from the Father also. He didn't want to use the power he had. He wanted to use the power that his Father had. Amen. Because he was living like you, like he wants you to live. Faith in the Father. He could have stopped all of that immediately, but he chose not to. Why? Because he was thinking about you. So as an adopted child, you can go to the Father just like the Son. And when you go to the Father with the right prayers, according to what the Scripture says, all he sees is the Son. And it's just like Jesus is in front of the Father saying this, because he is in front of the Father, interceding on your behalf. Mm. I want everybody to raise your hands as I reach out, uh, read verse 16 and 17. Raise your hands. Raise your hands. Raise both your hands up in the air. Raise both your hands up in the air. Look at this. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs to God and co heirs with Christ. Do you receive that? Trials in your life. Don't get worried 
when you go through struggle in your life. Your brother has struggled first. Your brother had trials first. Don't get worried when sin tempts you because your brother was tempted first. But you know what happened? He did not sin. He did not fall short. And that means that through him we are made heirs to God. Amen. Amen. Your brother lived life as God in, uh, and human, putting trust in the Father first. And so for us as Christians, we have to just put trust in the Father and trust that he is with us. Don't get dismayed. Don't get sidetracked. Don't think that you're going in the wrong direction. Don't think that you're not of God. Don't think that he's not with you. We 